Snoozecast, the podcast designed to help you fall asleep. On Snoozecast, we read excerpts from public domain works and occasionally original stories. Listen to us on snoozecast.com, like our Facebook page, and follow us on Instagram. We'd like to thank our listeners. If you enjoy our show and use an iPhone, please write us a review on the Apple Podcasts app. Also, share it with a friend. This episode is supported by Chirping Crickets. Tonight, we'll be reading from How to Amuse Yourself and Others, published in 1893 and written by Lena and Adelia Beard. A listener wrote to us asking for a snoozecast about pressed flowers. So the selections for tonight include that and other flower crafts, along with how to build a hammock. Let's get cozy. Close your eyes. Relax your body into the softness of your bed. Now, take a few deep breaths. Wildflowers and their preservation. Before the first green leaves make their appearance, while the snows of winter still linger in the shaded nooks and the branches are still bare, though blushing with the full flowing sap that tinges their tips pink, yellow, and red, when the air is filled with a sweet freshness and delicate fragrance, It's charming in our rambles to find scattered here and there upon the hillside, down among the roots of the great trees, or under the hedges, delicate little wild flowers waving on their fragile stalks with the faintest passing breeze. They are so exquisitely beautiful with their tender hues and graceful shapes that a longing comes to possess them. And why not keep them fresh at home? Plants live in the earth and require light, air, and moisture. All of these requirements can be and are fulfilled in thousands of homes where plants are kept all over the world. But these are wild flowers, true, and they may need something to be found only in the wild woods. What then is it? Let us see. Earth, light, and air abound everywhere. Still, upon inspection, we discover that the soil around our timid wild flowers is somewhat different from that to be found in our dooryards. But what is simpler than to take the earth up with the plant? Be careful in transplanting wild flowers. To dig well all around and under the roots so that the earth surrounding and clinging to the plant may be taken up at the same time. After covering the root and soil adhering to it with a layer of clay, mud, or damp earth, set the root in a large leaf and tie it up with string or a wisp of grass in order to make sure the soil does not fall off the plant. Thus secured, the specimens will keep nicely until you reach home. Then plant them in a shady place and keep the ground moist. Beautiful little woodland gardens are made in this way, 
where within a few steps of the door a glimpse may be had of the fair forest flowers. Sweet-scented white violets, delicate little anemones, odd yellow violets, and quaint jack-in-the-pulpits with many others, not forgetting the graceful ferns are now growing in the shaded corner of the writer's lawn, transplanted there from their home in the woods, where she found them one lovely spring morning, when out with a party of friends on a hunt for wild flowers. The day was perfect, filled with sunshine and the song of birds. All nature appeared glad and joyous, and the trees seemed veiled in the softest greens and pinks of budding leaves. It was a happy party that went wandering into the forest, straying here and there, and finding new treasures at nearly every step, stopping to gather a few of the violets that gave a purple tinge to the ground for yards around, then rambling onto the spot that was covered with the fragile anemone, each one of us laden with the flowers they loved best. Some had taken them up, roots and all, while others preferred the cut wild flowers. For these, it is best to use a tin box of convenient size and form, shutting closely. The flowers must be fresh and not at all damp. In such a box, they can be kept for days, bright and unfading. They may also safely be sent to friends at a distance, though it is better when sending flowers by mail, if you wish to send a quantity, to pack them in a strong pad or wooden box. First, lay down a piece of oiled paper of the proper size. Spread a thin layer of damp paper on this. Next, a layer of flowers then one of thin, wet paper, and so on until the box is full. Over the last layer, place a dry paper and cover this with oiled paper or tin foil. Put the lid on the box and tie it down securely. By this method, a large number of flowers can be sent in a given space than when simply enclosed in a tin box. The writer has often sent daisies from New York to Cincinnati, where they arrived as fresh as when first gathered. For the benefit of those who wish directions for sending flowers by mail, we give the following on authority of the American agriculturalist. The law passed some years since by Congress, allowing packages of plants to be sent by mail, if not over four pounds in weight, was a capital arrangement for those who lived at a distance from railroad and express offices. But it is so hampered with the various constructions given by the post office department that it is difficult to know what is required by the officials. The law now is, we believe, as follows. A package, weighing four pounds or less, can be sent at the rate of two cents per four ounces, but the writing of the words roots or plants makes a letter of it and is charged letter postage. Nothing should be written except the address and the package must not be sealed or contain any writing, and it must be so fastened that the postmaster can examine the contents if he wishes. The plants may, however, be numbered and their names sent by letter. Now, let us think of some way in which these lovely blossoms 
can be preserved. In Germany, they excel in making decorations for rooms, dinner tables, of preserved flowers. Bright colored flowers are best adapted to this method. White flowers are apt to turn yellow. Jack in the pulpit, clover, roses, and daisies came out beautifully when the writer dried them. And why should not many other kinds do just as well? Try and see. Procure three or four quarts of fine sand. White scouring sand is the best. Wash it perfectly clean. This can be tested by pouring the water off until it looks quite clear. Then dry the sand by placing it in a clean tin in the oven. When it is dry, fully dry, and cool, pour enough in a box to enable the flowers to stand by themselves, their stems embedded in the sand, which should be a mass of fine particles of uniform size. Preserved Flowers If the flowers are cut so that they all measure nearly the same length from the tip of the blossom to the end of the stem, they can more readily be covered with sand. The flowers must be fresh and entirely free from moisture. Place them stem downward in the sandy layer and very gently and very slowly pour in the sand a little at a time until each leaf and petal is firmly held in place. Then fill the box with sand nearly two inches above the level of the flowers. It's very essential that every particle of the flower rest in the sand and that in filling up the smallest petal has not been bent or crumpled. Take care not to shake the box, lest the flowers inside be injured. Set it in a warm, dry place and let it stand at least two weeks. This manner of preserving flowers retains the color while the shape of the leaves and petals remains unaltered. The flowers will keep for years. There are other ways also of preserving flowers. Pressed flowers and leaves. Although these are perfectly flat, they seldom fade and are very pretty and useful. Have ready a large book or a quantity of old newspapers and several weights. Use the newspapers for leaves and ferns. Blotting paper is best for the flowers. Both the flowers and leaves should be fresh and without moisture. Place them as nearly in their natural positions as possible in the book or papers and press allowing several thicknesses of paper between each layer. Remove the specimens to dry papers each day until perfectly dry. Some flowers must be immersed, all but the flower head, in boiling water for a few minutes before pressing to prevent them from turning black. Orchids are of this nature. If possible, it is well to obtain all parts of a plant, the roots as well as the seeds, for a more interesting collection can thus be made than from the flower and leaf alone. It is advisable to be provided with a blank book or, what is still better, pieces of stiff white paper of uniform size on which to mount the flowers or leaves when dried. Also, 
with a small bottle and a brush for fastening them and some narrow strips of court plaster or gummed paper for the stems and thicker parts of the plants. The sooner they can be mounted, the better. Place them carefully on the paper, writing beneath the locality and date of finding. Flowers and leaves thus prepared make beautiful herbariums. Should you desire leaves and ferns for decoration, first press them nicely, then give them a coat of wax by ironing them on both sides with a hot iron over which a piece of beeswax has first been rubbed. Cover the specimens completely with wax as this renders them quite pliable and they are no longer brittle nor easily broken. Sprays of small leaves can be pressed entire. To heighten the effect, use dry colors, rubbing them in and selecting those corresponding with the color of the leaves when first gathered. The colors must be put on before the coating of wax. Ferns should be gathered when nearly full grown and after they are pressed, painted light green with oil colors. In that case, the beeswax is not used. The oil in the paint, like the wax, makes the specimens more substantial and they look quite fresh and fair. Sometimes the late autumn frosts will bleach the ferns perfectly white. Then are they even more delicate than before nature changed their color. We have seen the color of flowers changed and it is a very pretty experiment. Very simple too. Immerse the flowers in ammonia and you will be surprised to see white lilies change to a delicate yellow. Pink roses turn a lovely bright green, while dark red sweet peas assume blue and rich purple tints, and the change is so rapid it is almost like magic. Another interesting experiment is making natural wax flowers by dipping the fresh buds and blossoms in paraffin just sufficiently hot to liquefy it. First the stems of the flowers, when these have cooled and hardened, then the flowers or sprays, holding them by the stalks and moving them gently. When they are completely covered, the flowers are removed and lightly shaken in order to throw off the superfluous wax. The flowers are then suspended until perfectly dry when they are found hermetically sealed in a film of paraffin while they still keep their beautiful coloring and natural forms and for a while, even their perfume. How to make a hammock. Underneath the spreading branches of the cool, shady tree swings our hammock. Through the intertwining boughs, the golden sunlight is sifted in bright little dashes on the leafy foliage below, lying ensconced in its lacy meshes, idly listening to the hum of the busy bumblebees at work among the red clover, or gazing up through the leafy canopy to the blue heavens, where now and then fleecy little clouds float softly past, or watching a flight of birds skim over the distant horizon. Who would not be lulled by the harmony 
of the summer day. A delightful languor steals over us, and we unconsciously drift into the land of dreams where perfect rest is found. We awaken refreshed to again gently swing back and forth and vaguely wonder who could have first thought of this most delightful invention. It is said that we owe the luxury to the Athenian, General Alcibiades, who, in 415 BC, first made the swinging bed. The word hammock is taken from hamakas or hamak, an Indian word which Columbus relates as being used by the Indians to signify a hanging bed composed of netting. What these men made with their implements, we ought to be able with our modern facilities to accomplish very easily and quickly. It is not difficult to make a hammock. Anyone can soon knit one that is strong and comfortable and it should not cost more than 50 cents. The materials required will be one hammock needle about nine inches long. This can be whittled out of hickory or ash or purchased for 10 cents. Two iron rings two and one half inches in diameter which will cost about five cents each. Two mesh sticks or fids, one 20 inches long and eight inches wide beveled on both edges, the other nine inches long and two and one half inches wide beveled on the long edge. These you can easily make yourself from any kind of wood. One pound of macrame cord number 24 or hammock twine of the same number which can be had for less than 30 cents. Colored cord comes 5 cents extra. Wind the cord in balls as it is then more convenient to handle and begin making your hammock. First, thread the needle by taking it in the left hand and using the thumb to hold the end of the cord in place. While looping it over the tongue, pass the cord down under the needle to the opposite side and catch it over the tongue. Repeat this until the needle is full. Commence the next row by again placing the fid under the cord and take up the first mesh, drawing it close to the fid. Hold it in place with your thumb while throwing the cord over your hand. Pass the needle on the left hand side of the mesh from under through the loop thrown over your hand. Pull this tight and you will have tied the common knitting knot. Proceed in this manner with all the loops in rotation until the row is finished. When it is necessary to thread or fill your needle, tie the ends of the cord with the fisherman's knot, which cannot slip when properly tightened. Wrap each end of the cord from the knot to securely on the main cord 
with strong thread to give a neat appearance to the hammock on the ring. Cut the loop on which the first row was knitted and draw it through the knots. Tie the end of the cord on your needle to the same piece used in fastening the end of the first needleful to the loop and knit the long meshes to the other ring as described. This completed, the hammock is finished. To swing it, secure two pieces of strong rope and fasten them firmly to the iron rings. The length of the rope, depending upon the space between the two points from which you wish it to hang. These should be, if possible, 12 or 15 feet apart and at last 10 feet high to give your hammock sufficient room to swing freely. This suspended bed will furnish a welcome retreat when the weather is too warm to admit of games, walks, or other amusements. Then, with some favorite book, or if even reading is too much of an exertion, simply to lie indolently in the hammock is a comfort so restful and quiet that the time quickly passes and we are made better and brighter for our short, passive repose. Very decorative nets and useful ones of many kinds, including fish nets and minnow seines, are made with the same stitch as that used in the hammock. The size of the mesh is regulated by the circumference of the fit, and the twine used is fine or coarse according to the style of net desired. Barrel Hammocks When in the Catskills last summer, the writer saw for the first time a hammock made of a barrel. It was painted red and looked very cheery and inviting, hanging under the green boughs, the two colors being complementary, harmonized beautifully. This hammock was made of a piece of strong rope. 20 feet long, threaded in and out of barrel staves, and was substantial and durable. The construction of such a hammock is very simple. Remove the top and bottom hoops and nails from a firm, clean barrel. Then, before taking off, the remaining hoops draw a pencil line around both ends of the barrel, being careful to have a marking three inches from and parallel to the edges. This is the guide when making the two holes in each end of all the staves. <laughs>